name is Frank Chester, and I was born in Hollywood, California, 1939. My dad was an aeronautical engineer, and he taught me uh, mechanical drawing when I was a little kid. And of course, mechanical drawing consisted of T-square, a board, and triangles. And there are two triangles in, that they use. Is one is a 30-60, and the other one is 45. Well, I always liked these triangles. And I always used to put them together like this, because I like that kite. I like that shape. OK, but you're supposed to put them together like this, which makes an equilateral triangle. Hmm? All right, so when I first started this form, I thought, well, I have to have seven. So I knew that there would have to be a three and a four, which makes seven. So I didn't quite know what to do, but I did know that if I take an equilateral triangle like this, and if I switch it around like this, they're equal. The area is equal. I mean, you can't deny that. This area is exactly the same as this area. So, aha, I had the three and a four. So I decided that I would take these triangles right here, um, and I would make my kite. And the reason I, I like the kite, because when I was a kid, I made kites. And they were just this shape. So what I did is I made this. And what I did is I put those triangles on here, like that. And then I did it over here, same way. Follow me? I did that all the way around. They're in the red. So those little guys right there are that kite. All right, so when I did that, um, I had to put a base, because this would just flop over if I didn't. So I had to put a base of a triangle. And then I realized that to, to this angle here, I also had to put a triangle. And I had this first form is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I had a seven-sided form. But the problem was is I didn't want this. I wanted equal surfaces. And these three were equal, and these four were equal, but they weren't equal together. I want the same surface area here as I have here, and you can see that it isn't. But I liked it. It was, my, uh, it was an attempt, right? It's an attempt to get to this. So what I did is I made a couple of those and put them together just to see. I had no idea what this is, and of course this is, you know, it's not in the books. I put three of them together, and I realized that on the inside had a a triangle, tetrahedron. So I made a tetrahedron that would fit in there. That's perfect. No matter where I put it in, it fills that hole. Then I put the other one on top, and I have a tetrahedron with a tetrahedron on the inside like this. That's called a dual, and that right there is geometrically been discovered thousands of years ago, all based on seven. No one ever thought of taking a tetrahedron apart like that and having it that size. But that, I wasn't happy. That wasn't what I wanted. Well, here I go. I decided that this working here um, geometrically, uh, mathematically uh, precise and so forth, I couldn't get it. I had to go to the artistic side. And so well, the first thing I did is I took and made seven sticks the same length and the same distance apart all the way around. That's how I started. That's a, a liquid amber seed in there. I push it into the seed holes and put uh, mud around it to hold it in place. And that's what I discovered 14 years ago. What did I do? I noticed that this was a triangle. This was a triangle. They're all triangles. And so when you connect seven points, same distance apart, same length, you've got ten sides. Ten sides, not seven. Ten. 
So then I knew that I probably bit off more than I, 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 uh, I thought it. But I was encouraged by this drawing here, um, or this, this uh, picture. This picture is um, the inside of the first building that Ruta Steiner designed, and these are capitals. There are seven capitals. And this is the first one, and that's the one I really liked. And since I wanted to make something like that, but had seven sides, like a sculpture. This is seven all around a circle. That's not sculpture. It's reliefs. So this is what really inspired me. Two years later, I started with this and a sticks and mud. Well, so uh, when a, when a, a mathematician asked a friend of mine, well, how did he find this form? And he says, well, he took seven sticks in the mud and made it all equal. And the guy started laughing. So my friend said, well, why are you laughing? He says, because where's he from? I said, oh, he's from, you know, he's an American. He says, you know, those people out there don't know what doesn't work. We know better than to try that. Because it doesn't work. Well, I don't know that. So next thing I did is I took... Um, Seven floaters, the little blobs that they use for fishing, They're usually half red and half white. I took seven of them and I pushed them all together with a piece of clay in the middle and I got this because I thought, well, hey, I'm going to get seven sided form. Well, this is what I got. Um, it's kind of cool because it's like a vertebrae and I don't, it's a cool sculpture. But it's <laughs> not quite what I'm after, is it? I, don't, you know, I want you know, like this. Well, it didn't work, but one thing I did notice is that when you push the balls together, these two won't allow these two to come together, so they become gaps. There's a gap there. Look at that. Those, those won't come together because these two prevent it. Does that make sense? These two won't allow these two to come together, so you get this gap. Okay. So I started from the center, the periphery, and then I went to the periphery, and I found out if I talk, start with a sphere, why don't I just try carving out seven volcanoes? So I did, and this is what I got. This is original, 14 years ago. This was the first seven-sided form. And what I did is when I carved the circles, there were seven round circles, but when they came together, there was the gap. But artists don't care about gaps. We don't care. We care less. We just keep carving. And so when I kept carving, okay, and this gap started to, to go away, there's another gap. See, look, there's two big gaps. One here. When I started carving this, I found out that I had a, a, a shape that had one, two, three, four. And then I went over here and had one, two, three. Oh, there was a three and a four. I couldn't believe it. So then what I did was I, f I saw that there was two triangles here and two here and two here. That made up that, that one. Then I saw that over here that there was one, two, three, four, five, six. And I thought, oh my gosh, these are, there are six triangles all the way around this. So I counted up the triangles and there are 42 triangles. So what did I do? I made all the I made all these triangles. And what I did was I put it together and here it is. These are all the triangles. But what happened is there's a triangle here and here and there's two down here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Then over here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. And what I found out was that I had to straighten. I had to straighten this one out. I had to push these two together. And when I did, uh, th they weren't bent anymore and they turned into a kite. And so what I did is I put plaster of Paris in here and plaster of Paris in here and here and here and there is what filled up. A kite and a triangle. And this is the first Shestahedron that came out of here. I mean, I, ha I had a big one. And this is the first Shetahedron. And you can see that it's far from being accurate. That's because it was discovered artistically. The mathematics didn't enter this at all. The artistic process in it. Then when you take art and you apply it to science, okay, 
then you have the mingling of these two. You have to have the mingling of these two, or you would end up with this and be happy and say, hey, uh, this is cool, I feel, I love it. Uh, or this one here is all dry or whatever. It's gotta be these two together because there's things inside this, there's things outside this that can be discovered. And this is how simple you need to be to start. That's all you have to do is have a desire about something you wanna do and stick with it for 14 years. I don't know about that, but that's what I did. And so, you see the results of that work. And I taught for 32 years. I taught art, uh, mathematics, um, welding, auto shop, plastics, woodworking, cabinet making, home construction, sculpture, all of these things I taught for all that time. And I never could figure out why did I have so many skills? It always confused me. Why, why can't I do all this stuff? Why isn't it that I'm not stuck with one thing and really good at it? I was good at, I can make anything. I can make anything today. Why? Because I learned how to do all these steps so that when I turned 60 and I was ready to do this, I never had to ask anybody's help. I could make anything. All right, this farm has never been on the planet before. So it is new and it has a relationship with every one of us that lives here from the time we're born until the time we die. So I'm going to explain why I can say that. As this was discovered, it was not invented. And what that means is, is that something that's invented, usually you'll have a number of people inventing the same thing within a few weeks. But no one has ever come up with this since Earth started until today. And it's been 15 years and still no one has come up with this. So I'm going to talk to you about this today. And I'm going to show you where it comes from. I'm going to show you how I discovered it. I can show you where it is. And I used a process to do that. So sacred geometry is very important because this was discovered artistically. And this was discovered through sacred geometry. So everyone else, what is sacred geometry? Sacred geometry uses three tools, and here they are. A straight edge, a compass, and a pencil. That's all I use to find this form. This form has seven equal surface areas, exactly. So, this affects every single person on the planet. And this can change, bring a new consciousness to you if you understand it, and you will after this lecture, because I'm going to explain it thoroughly. All right, so let's start with sacred geometry. This is how I discovered the geometry based on this form. So this form comes from three stars. Here's one star. The other star just so that you can see exactly where they are. Now, you're going to say, well, how does this come out of here? Well, the first place off is that everything that you see here was never measured. There are only two circles to take this construction here, and you don't have to measure it. All you have to know is the golden mean. So the golden mean is the basis of all this. So you're thinking, well, where is this? Right here. take that and I put it together and there's your seven-sided form. Cute little guy. You can see where it came from. Now, these are examples of the seven-sided form, both in clear acrylic and through an open type of uh, surface to a solid one and also another one. So this was found by using the first form that comes into nature which is the tetrahedron. All right, so everyone knows that there is a cube which is also a platonic form. This is six-sided. The seven-sided form 
comes from the six. Also, if you take this cube and you shave off all the edges, it turns into what we call a dodecahedron. Now, a dodecahedron has 12 faces. This has 7, cube 7, and this has 12. And if I take this and do a process that I went through, I found out that around that form is a 13 sided form. I have a 13 sided from a 12, and we have a 7 from a 6. And this goes inside this. It's called a decatria, deca for 10 and tria for 3. And it also, this goes outside the chestahedron and also goes inside. And I'm calling this the chestahedron. All right. So if we take the chestahedron and we look just at the edges, okay, so I've eliminated all of the faces and I'll look just at the edges. I'm going to start to show you what I found was inside this form. But what was inside the form, okay, um, I took the triangle here that's at the top and the triangle that's at the bottom, and I start to move these down. I start to move these down like this. And at the same time, I start to move this bigger one up. And what happens is, is that when I get this just exactly right, I move it up until it's exactly right, there is now a six-pointed star coming out of the middle of this form, a six-pointed star. Now, if you take that six-pointed star, put it right there, and of course, in this one, I made that six-pointed star a hexagram out of copper. And of course, there is the Star of David, or two equilateral triangles that come together in a perfect balance. And so if I take this apart, all right, there is the top of the chetahedron, which comes from a five-pointed star. By enfolding it and enfolding it, it becomes the seven-sided form. There it is, right there. There it is here. These are the kites. The kites come from a five-pointed star. So, these are the kites. Now, you notice that when I take this apart, there's the six. Now, the bottom part of this form comes from a tetrahedron. So, if I open up a tetrahedron to a certain degree, like this, I can put this seven-sided form inside there, and that's the bottom part. Here's the top, here's the bottom. And the bottom also has six. And it only can have six at a certain angle because this distance from here to here and from here to here have to be equal or you never get the six. And when this opens up, it can only open up to a point where it becomes equal. This distance and this distance can only be at a certain point of opening this up. And then when I put them together, what's amazing is that they line up exactly at the same place, no matter where it goes together. It's the same place. So, if I take more of an advanced view of this form, I now have something inside. And what's inside is a cube. How can there possibly be a cube inside this? Well, I'll do this again. I'll take this down here like this, like I did before, these rubber bands, and you'll notice that when I bring it down, that it lines up with one triangle that's red. If I move this up, like I did before, until it gets to that same point where the first star hit, I now have the six-pointed star in red. Now you'll notice that there is a cube in the middle of that star. So how did I possibly get that? Well, I took 
a hexagram, again, the middle. I made it the same size. As you can see, it's the same size. Here, here, all the way around. And, and if I take the distance between two equilateral triangles like this, which is red, you can see that. If I put this in the middle and stretch this out to six, it becomes a perfect cube. And that's the size of the cube that's in this form. Now when I take the cube and I put an equilateral triangle, which is where this comes from, as I showed you before, there is an equilateral triangle. Now if I take two of them put together, put one upside down and one right side up, it makes what they call the Merkaba. And there it is inside the cube, right suspended inside this seven-sided form. All right, so I'm going to explain how I uh, took this form and tried to find out where it's coming from. This is an important question. So I had to develop an artistic process that was unique. And I did that by studying the four uh, platonic forms, tetrahedron, octahedron, icosahedron, and the cube. Now, I didn't find this through mathematics. I found this through art. And that's my background. This is an artistic discovery. An artistic discovery, okay, then can be put into science. So the artistic process is very expansive. Um, and it can become very subjective. The other half of this, or the balance of the artistic process, is science. Now, science is contractive. That's the opposite of the expansion, is contraction. All right. You need both the expansion and the contraction to reach a balance. And that balance is what we're after. Not to be out of balance, but to be in balance. So, you cannot get stuck with being an artist and not do any science. You can't be stuck as a scientist without some artistic training, or artistic background. Okay. Because if you get stuck in those two ends, you're in trouble. Big time trouble. So it's, it's all of the artistic, and it's all of the formulas that come together. Can't be one or the other. So, I'm going to tell you how I discovered the form, or how I put the form through this process. Now this process is unique. Because I didn't know how to do this, there were no books on it, whatever, period. But I knew that if I could find where this was, okay, in the earth, where, where it is, I needed to put it through an earth process. What is this? This is earth, okay, this is water, this is air, and this is fire. So, uh, it's a tetrahedron, an octahedron. Uh, icosahedron, and a cube. Now you notice that this is a natural form, and so is this. This represents a number of things. This is the earth, this is water, this is air, and fire, like I said before. These are also connected with the organs. So these are archetypes, and we work with archetypes because they are very important to understand in relationship to how to find something here. Where is this? Is it is it, a, is it a cube, or is it coming from water, or is it basically an air form, or is it fire? So, here's what I did. I first studied the earth, and the earth is what's everything that's different. Everything that's different. So, you have to compare this form to everything that's different. And of course, there's never been here before. It's never been here before, because it was a discovery, not an invention. So I found out that one of the things that I could do is that this has seven points, you can believe it, it has seven points, it has seven faces, they're all equal, there are two polygons, there's a triangle, and what I call a kite, which you now know is one of the arms of a five-pointed star. So, 
what I was able to do was I'm able to put seven points, okay, and to six faces. Now, how do you do that? Well, so it took a while, and I found out that it fits in a cube like this. There is this form inside a cube. And what I found out is that the base of the form touches the, this area of the cube, and one of the points touch a vertice at the very corner. But the other three touch the face. One here, one here, and one here. And that's never been done before. So this was my earth study. But this didn't indicate to me where it is or where it's from or whatever. So I had to go to the next process. The next process is water, which represents the icosahedron. So I had to figure out, well, how can I figure out what a water form, well, what do I do with water with, with this? So what I had found that worked was that I took the form and I put it into edges only. So water is what flows, it moves. So I thought, well, how can I move this? This is a very strong form. I can't move it this way, I can't move it this way, whatever. The only thing I could do was to spin it. And so I spun it and it turned into a bell. That's the water process. And I saw that the form actually took on curves. There's no, no, no curves here, but there is in movement. And also, I don't know if you can see those black lines in there. I'll turn it upside down. I don't know if I see those black lines, but I see them, so I drew them. So right back to the sacred geometry, those are the lines that you see when the form is in motion. And when the form comes to rest, it looks like this. It looks like a bell. And this is an accurate geometric sacred geometry based on what you're seeing here. And what's so interesting is you have lines running this way and you have lines running this way. And that's very important to remember that you have these different lines. All right, so I didn't, I found out there was a bell, okay. Uh, I, I found out that I could take a straight line and make it a curve. So in a lot of, in a certain sense, the distance between two points in the shortest distance is a curve. That's interesting, isn't it? All right. Well, okay. And that was a, a wonderful discovery that I used a lot of, uh, for other things. So here's the earth, here's the water. Now I came to air. This is known as air. So, as you know, this is like a cube of ice, and then you put some fire, you put a heat underneath the ice, and it turns into water. And, and then you put water more under the water, it turns to air. And then what did you do all that with is fire. So we need to look at the, at the air now. And so let's look at the air. What did I do with air? Air is everything that's reversing, okay? It's the exact opposite reversal of Earth, of the cube. Because I can put this form in the cube, and I also can put this form on the outside of the cube. That's wonderful, isn't it? That's a reversal. All right, so how do I reverse this? How do I apply earth, water, air to this form? How do I do that? Well, what I did is I did found out that the best thing to do if this is a polar opposite or if this is a reversal is to turn this inside out. So I did, I figured it out and it took a while, but I figured out how to turn it inside out. And here it is. This is the form inside out. He's kind of a neat looking form. He's very unusual, nothing like it on the planet. But this is the form turned inside out. This is known as air. And you notice it's expansive. It's, it's more expansive. And what happens is the center of the form comes out to the periphery. Another opposite, right? This is more peripheral. This is more centric. So you're going to say, well, sure, what that, that, that's real nice, but I, I can't believe that's turned inside out. 
And I understand that belief. So that's why I made it so that I could turn it inside out and bring it back and find out what was inside it. And what's inside it? A little seven-sided farm, same size, same size. So that's what this looks like turned inside out. So I made that like this. I decided to take the inside out and put it into water. So I did, and here it is. This is the form in water. That's air. This is called air. These we call these aerial sculptures, because my major is air is, is sculpture. So, how do you, how 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 can you make the air process show up in water? Because there should be water in here as well as air. And so the only way to do that is to take this back into air, into water, I'm sorry, bring the form back into water, and then find out if there's a bell in it. Can you see the bell? Look at that. There is a bell in this form, which is exactly where it should be. If it's turned inside out, then you should have a bell and you do. All right, so that takes care of this process. I'm looking for where this form is in the world. I want to know if it is in the elements. Is it an aerial form or is it, is it an, a water form or is it fire? So what is fire all about? Remember, fire is the transformation. Because of this guy, these can transform. They can transform. Without fire, these can't transform. That's the way it is. So. What I was able to do is to take this form and put it into movement so that the corners, vertices, turn in space and time. It's a time-space element. And so when I did that, I came up with this form. This is the seven-sided form and movement through space-time. And what's so amazing about it is that it has, it's, it's almost like a double heart. It's a valentine, you know, the heart doesn't look like a valentine, but this does. And it does look like it has a little one at the top, and at, and at the bottom one is a big one. This is the fire process. So now I have all of the processes right here in front of you, from fire, from reversal, which is, of course, this one. I mean, let's, let's, let's make this disappear, all right? We'll make this disappear. We'll completely surround it, and now it's inside out. Air, water, earth. All right, here we going back to the original form that I explained at the very beginning. And then I talked about what was inside the form and that there was a six-pointed star. And it's very important that sacred geometry is very, very tied up with the golden mean proportion. And these are five calipers. And so one of the things that you should realize is that when this comes up here to make the six-pointed star, there's a certain point where it goes, and it goes right to the golden mean. Now that is amazing because this distance wasn't created by me, it was created by the rubber bands. And then if you take the distance from the triangle, and you take the hypotenuse, you'll find out that that shows you the size of the top of the form. Another amazing relationship. All right, so I'll put this aside. And then if I go into the bell, here is one the bell in motion that's come to rest. You can see where all of those lines are happening, and here it is completely into the bell. Okay, so now we'll move on, because what I want to show you now is some other discoveries that I found based on sacred geometry. One of the great, the greatest two-dimensional geometry ever discovered is the flower of life. The flower of life, okay, is there's nothing more important two-dimensionally than this design. It's top of the line. And it's all based on 
circles the same size, 19 of them. So I was always interested in the flower of life, and I always was wondering how it could relate to this. So I studied it in, uh, in 2001, and I found that the top view fit, but um, that was as far as I could go. So then I took it up again over years and years and found out that the flower of life, um, in the very center of it, the center of it, it's based on six. So, uh, of course, that, what went through my mind was that the six-pointed star is in the middle of the chestahedron, or the, the seven-sided form. I thought I'd put it in the flower of life, and I did, and it fits. There it is. It's the, the, the seven-sided form is exactly that six-pointed star, okay, is right in the middle of the flower of life. So then um, I noticed that there were another abundance circles that were running around here, and of course the outside of the flower of life is where my hands are. So I tried to figure out what is, is this circle. Now, one of the things about the seven-sided form that's always disturbed me until I found out why, that this star is not even. This distance from here is not the same as here, is it? That's not the same. This is higher than this. Well, I want this in the middle. That would be really cool if it was in right in the middle. It's not. And I just have to live with it. So here's an example of it not being in the middle. You can see that the distance from here to here is shorter than from here to here. And then there's a circle. So then I thought, well, okay, can I take the seven-sided form, would it be possible for me to take this and put it into a sphere? That would be really great if I could. So I took... Um, this form, and you can see that there's the star, there's the star, six-pointed star, and also inside, okay, is the hexagram. So when I put it into a sphere, the middle of the seven-sided form is right in the equator of the sphere. So all of my concern about it not being in the middle was a waste of time, because what it is, is in when you put it in a sphere, Okay, it's exactly at the equator, the exact middle. That's amazing that happened. So, when I had this form sitting in the sitting in the flower of life. All right. So, what is this circle? So, I took a sphere. It's exactly the size of that circle. Now that touches the top of the chestahedron. Oh, I call this the seven-sided form. And if I put the second half of the sphere on here and put it together, and now that flower of life, which is called in this case the seed of life, okay, is exactly in the middle of the sphere, and the bottom three points of the seven-sided form touch the bottom of the sphere, and the top touches the top. And now you have the, the seven-sided form which I call the chestahedron, is in the middle of the sphere, and the six is exactly in the middle of that form. And then I thought, well, what is this outer circle all about? What about this circle here? All right, so I'm going to put this aside right here. So if you take a circle, and you put the circle, the sphere, into a cube, okay, the faces of the cube, okay, should touch the sphere. It does. So if you look at this exactly straight on, you'll see a circle and a square. But when you put it three-dimensionally, the sphere and the cube now become a, a same relationship except it touches the outer face. Now, this particular geometry is used also by another person. This person is a great artist. His name um, is Russell. Now, Russell used this exclusively 
and a lot of his geometry. His name is Walter Russell. I recommend you look him up. So what I had found out was that this square was in the outside of the larger circle. So here it is this form and this all you do is connect the six that goes on around and it makes a cube that goes around the outside of the flower of the life and that's amazing that's absolutely amazing and the surface of the cube touches the surface of the sphere now you're going to wonder what's going on inside here well what's going on inside there is i found out that by doing this the inside okay of the earth has a core, an inner core. And that inner core is exactly the size of the cube that goes around the inside of the flower of life, again. So what it means is that you have a cube with a sphere in it on the inside, and you have a cube and a sphere on the outside, so below, so above. And that's amazing, and I can show both the inner core the outer core, and the mantle based on this model. So therefore, the seven-sided form is in the earth, according to this research. Now, how are you going to prove that? Well, one of the things I did is when I was doing this, this article came out in Scientific America. And what does it say? It says, Sculpturing the earth from inside out. Oh, that's right up my line. Oh, inside that article, okay, there was this drawing. Oh, that's it. This drawing was inside of it. And this is the earth, a map of the earth, two-dimensionally, right? I mean, so we all get in our maps. Now, they did CAT scans type of measurements of, in the earth, and they found out that very, very dark um, very, very dark, the dark area, okay, means that inside the earth is deep, it's very deep and very cold, whereas where you get to the yellows and the red, it's more to the surface and it's warm. So when I saw this article, I went and looked this guy up, and he worked at Cal, Cal Poly, um, no, Cal State in Los Angeles, met him, I asked him, what's this going on? He says, well, this is the deep areas. We don't understand what's configuration, but this is where it's very, very deep and cool. And I said, well, what does that mean? He said, we have no idea. So I thought, well, I wonder if this has anything to do with what I found in the earth. So I took this form and I laid it out flat. I can lay it out flat just like they did. And so I did, and I found out that this is the way that the seven-sided form fits into the earth. Okay, and you can see that this deep area here, which is, this is deep, is because, you know, those lines inside are deep into a sphere, the, the seven-sided form. So this is the chetahedron, or the seven-sided form, is actually part of this edge. Look at these points that line up. They have no idea why this does. Has anything to do with this. So this was very encouraging to me that I could keep this process up of studying the earth. So, what I did was to find out as much as I could about this, is that I wanted to find out what is the shape that goes around this, and I found out that it's based on a cone that's 22 and a half degrees. So, this is the cone that goes around the chestahedron, 22 and a half degrees. And that same cone, the same cone, will also go inside. And you can see, I made a hole here, so you can see that that point comes right to the point of the seven-sided form, and that's the same size circle. Now that's amazing that we have a cone that goes around the outside and on the inside exactly at 22 and a half degrees. So if I take this out of here, you'll find out that this is from the same cone. I just cut it here, right? So that would fit here, and that would fit there. See how that works? So if I take this, and I put it in a sphere, and I take this, and I put it in a sphere, 
there it is. I can take this one and I can drop it into that hole, which is exactly the size of the cone. I can drop it in there and it has a little point, needs to be a little more, but there is a cone within a cone. So what I have found is, is that there is a ring around here that's very wide, but down here the ring is the same size as the top. So when you see pictures of the aurora borealis, you'll see that the top and the bottom are the same size. Now they can't explain that. The scientists can't explain that. And so what is happening here is that at the top, the aurora borealis goes around between this ring and this ring and makes an oval. But down here it doesn't do that. It doesn't ever make an oval and the aurora borealis can go into that space, whereas the top, the aurora borealis never goes into this space, never. This is always dark with the oval of aurora borealis. This is always more or less lit, but dark on the outside. This is the only explanation that anybody has come up to why that happens. So what I see is the aurora borealis comes in from the top, like this, there's an oval here. It comes in to the top right here, that's why it's always black. When it reaches this point, it crosses over into this and that lights this ring up, just, and then it comes back up. So the aurora borealis that you're seeing is energy not coming into the Earth, it's leaving. Now that's very interesting. And that's very interesting, it's made from the same cone. Same cone. Let's see, I think I can even show you here. Yep, the edna of the cone touch the t uh, apex of the seven-sided form, it makes that circle, and that circle is exactly the size of the core of the Earth. Exactly. The scientists cannot figure out why the core is that size. There's no explanation geometrically. None. Now there it is. And that's also part of the flower of life. Another reason why this is so, the sacred geometry is so, so important. There it is. Here it is here. I'll end you by showing you this. To the point of the seven-sided form. And then let's see where the other guy is. Yeah, here, right in front of me. Hi, I'd like to show you something that has to do with the flower of life. I'm gonna go back to that. The flower of life has 19 circles. These 19 circles, okay, are exactly the same distance if I have two circles and I spread them apart where the center is, now you have the way the flower of life is completely constructed. So the center hits the periphery of one circle and then the center of the other one hits the periphery of the other one. And when those two come together, there's an almond shape. And if I draw a line exactly from one edge of that almond shape to the other, like this, Now you see that there are, the red line is between, exactly between the two circles that are interrelated. That distance is the square root of three. Perfect. Just like you saw in the cube. So, if you try to remember this, I'm going to put this aside, and then I'm going to show you that inside the heart, there is a loop. It starts from the outside of the uh, 180 degrees apart. It goes up across like this. It goes and it rolls around the back side of the heart, the myofibers, and runs back to the other side. Now these are the myofibers in here. Now I have not seen the research on what exactly it's supposed to do, but this is what it looks like. So where does that come from? You have to remember that this is the same cone that fits around the chestahedron. Same cone. 22 and a half degrees. So let's undo this and see what this is. We're going to undo this into a circle. This makes a circle. Same size circle that I started out with here. 
That line is root three, the square root of three. Now tell me that there's not geometry behind the human heart. Now, the only problem is, is that when I turn this into a, a cone, which I have to do, I'm going to show you this. This is the same size circle all the way through. Now, projective geometry, we take a plane and we run lines across it. That's what I did here. This is a plane, and I ran lines across it. So what I want to do is to make this into a cone. So if I make this into a cone, and this is in any of the books, and I make two cones, the lines become curvilinear. That's really amazing. But this won't fit over the Chetahedron yet. It's too big. So I have to do it some more. So let's take it and see what happens when I take and make three cones. Not just two, which you just saw, but I make three cones. And when I make three cones, all of the lines are now triangles. Triangles. Believe that? That's three cones. One, two, three. Still won't go over. I mean, it's still too big. So now I'm going to take this and put it into four. So here I go. Twist it into four. And when I twist it into four, it turns itself into all squares. Quadrilateral squares. And now it fits over. Well, it's supposed to, but it does. There, all squares, and it fits over the chestahedron. Well, the problem with this is, is that the heart has eight layers of myofibers. Eight, this one has four. So what that means is, is there's got to be two of these. Two cones at 22 and a half degrees, four each which equals A. So, what do we do about that? Well, I know I could get four out of this, and I know I can get four out of this. There's four cones, there's a, there's a cone in here that's four, and a cone in here is four, and if I put them together and twist them together, there are eight. So, what I did was I put that into paper, and I made a spiral. And the reason I made this a spiral because the research on the myofibers of the human heart, there are eight layers. And there is an illustration of those eight layers that you will see of the myofibers. And you will see that the myofibers go around and tuck into here. And so what this is a vortex. Look, and there's one on the back too. So what I decided to do, well, let's see, let's see how this all works. So if I take and start to make the cone, and I paper clip it together, like this, that is 22 and a half degrees, which you saw when I did the plastic. So if I roll this around like this, I will get four layers when I come to the middle or the end of the first circle. And where is the end? Right there. See that line right there? That's the end. That makes four circles. It makes four cones. One, two, three, four. So, that's great. So now what I do is I take the other end and do the same thing. So I'll put the paper clip here. So it doesn't unfold. There's the midpoint. In other words, this will make one circle. Look at this. Make sure that this is lawful. See how that makes one circle? Okay, so what I do is I'm going to roll this around do the same thing. Put a paper clip here to hold it together and as I go around I now have two cones for each. One for the red and one for the blue blood. But that's not the way it is. This has to be inside there. All right, so if I cut this, I can put this cone, I can put it in here. 
But then it just slips right out. That's in the heart. The heart is really, really combined. So I kept looking at this and looking at this and looking at this, and what I found out was that all I had to do, okay, was to do this. I take this paper clip off. So what I did now, I just rolled it, continued to roll in the same direction. And so what happened was, I got an eight layer cone at 22 and a half degrees. The answer to the myofiber problem. So what's happening here is that the same thing you saw on the bell. You saw an angle of the bell that was running this way and you saw strings running this way. Okay, so when you look at the human heart, the outside of the heart, okay, the myofibers go in the top to the bottom, like this. So as you undo it, okay, the more you undo it, the less the angle is created here. So you notice how it's getting less an angle? And then, when you get to the middle, it's straight across. So now what has to happen is that they have to go from the bottom up in the opposite direction. So let's happen if we continue to go Let's see what happens. They're still pretty flat, because that's the midpoint. Now look what they're doing. They're starting to go up in the opposite direction. And now look how much steeper they are, completely opposite like the bell. The lines are completely the opposite. And there is the last, the last cone is completely opposite. That's a major discovery about the human heart. Here we go again. We put the chestahedron now, which we know this belongs in the chest, we put it into edges again, like we did before, which is when, when you spin turns into a bell. Now, what I did was I split all the lines in half. Okay, so this is one line, it's one line, but I cut them in half. And so I want to separate them. And when I separate them, remember, this is a seven sided form, and if I separated it, Okay, it takes a little while. I can separate all the lines and I get this form, and this form, and this one. So here we have, geometrically, as a symbol, the beat, the rhythm. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, that's one thing you can look at here. And then what's so amazing is that the other two are spinning in opposite directions. That's coming out of the same form. So inside the form itself, you have a reversal and movement all in one form. So well, here are the triangles that make up the six-pointed star. And you can see that those two are spinning in opposite directions. Another indication that we have a reversal of the heart moving to the right and moving to the left, two vortexes. One of the main things that we need to look at here is that this is not the shape of our heart. Just, my heart doesn't look like this. So I had to go into to find out how to make a geometric form organic. So this is how I did it. I put this into lines again, and I dipped it in soap, and I blew a bubble. And inside this, inside this form, there is a bubble, and this is what it looks like. That is a seven-sided bubble. And if you look at any of the images of the left ventricle of the human heart, you will see that it's round on the top, it slopes down like this, and it comes to a point. And it's three, one, two, three. It looks like this. This is what that right ventricle, left ventricle looks like. Now the right ventricle and left ventricle are different because one is collapsed. The right 
side of the heart is a collapsed vortex. This is a vortex that I can put into a vortex machine. Now, what happens is this part of the heart is accelerating the vortex, and this part is deaccelerating. So this is slowing down and this is speeding up. Again, that the heart is a perfect balance between acceleration and deacceleration. So, this is really how the bubble looks when it is in the cube. It has edges because there's a plane of soap that goes to the part of the chestahedron. But once that soap is broken, these edges become round. And that's why this is the final shape of this seven-sided form. Now, I put this form into a vortex, and then I tilted the form at 36 degrees, because I knew that's what angle it sits in the heart, that sits in the body, how the heart, at 36 degrees approximately, and I found out that the vortex goes around this form, okay, and distorts the vortex. So I put it in there, I put the bell in first, and I put it inside the vortex, 36 degrees, and then I filled in all of the spots that the vortex was taking, and this is what it looks like. That is the other vortex, so they're exactly the same size as the red one. That's upside down. So if you look at that, that is right there, the right ventricle, this is, this is the left ventricle, this is the right ventricle. And this space right here, if you fill this up with sand and pour it out, and you fill this up with sand, it's the same amount of sand. And you can see that, if you look at any of the heart research, you can see that where this joins, where the right and the left join, it has that curve. And it goes a little bit beyond the edge here. And that's exactly what the vortex is doing. It doesn't just end on this line right here, it kind of overlaps it a little bit. Just like the real heart that you see in a human being. One of the things I discovered is when I put it into a cube, I divided the cube into 16 squares. And therefore, I found out where these corners hit. So if I knew where these corners hit, then I knew that if I went from this cube up to the corner or to the center of the cube, I could find out where this form is coming from, geometrically. So what I did is I took that point and I ran it up to here, and I found out, okay, that it is a tetrahedron. This is a tetrahedron that has turned. And as soon as it turns, one hair of the degree it becomes a seven-sided form. Absolutely. Now between here and here, let me rip this turn around here. That should be root three. That should be root three. And so this inside a cube would be the transition from this to this to this. And that looks like this. And of course this one looks like that. And this one looks like a tetrahedron. But here's what we've got to do. We've got to get these into minimum surfaces. Now minimum surfaces, that's what this is. This is minimum surface. This is a bubble. Now, why, what minimum surface is all about is every geometric form is trying to become a sphere. Every one of them. Because the geometric form doesn't hold enough volume, okay, for its surface area, how much surface area it has, and as the sphere does. So it's bowing out, trying, oh, I want to be a sphere, you know, kind of like that. So this is a minimum surface, okay, of this. Okay, so here's the minimum surfaces, right there. I'll lay it on its side. So, what's the minimum surface of this one? The tetrahedron started out. Because this will indicate to us what's going on in this transition. This is a tetrahedron in minimum surfaces. This guy turns into minimum surfaces by having a bubble inside it. That's what the bubble looks like. This guy has a bubble inside it. It looks like this. All right, so what happens if I continue to expand this, or I continue to develop this movement from here to here? And what happens is that 
the seven-sided form becomes six. It turns into a six-sided form. So, from a tetrahedron to the chestahedron, the chestahedron turns into a cube. I'll leave it. It turns into a cube. What we've got is we've got a tetrahedron to the chestahedron to the hexahedron. This is the healthy heart. It's, a, it's a balanced between a tetrahedron and a cube. And you know that the tetrahedron fits into a cube. And it's a balance between this guy and this guy right in the middle. So I have found out exactly what happens between here and the cube. Imagine that. I found out what, how this becomes a cube. Here it is. It is now turning into a cube. So that this is becoming a square. So is this. So is this. So is this. So is this, so is this. So because when this starts to move down, it all turns into squares. So this is the first sign of congestive heart failure. This is what it appears, and it's size, and it's all in scale. Everything you see here is in scale. But what happens is, is that the valve at the top, which is the mitral valve, is starting to become a smaller triangle because these triangles are expanding like this. They're all expanding at the same rate, all the way around. But when this one expands here, this starts to move down and it eventually becomes a point. And that point becomes six. So once the heart becomes six, you're in big trouble. It's called congestive heart failure, and the next thing is uh, how many deaths that are coming from the heart getting in this configuration are unbelievable in our, in, our, in our United States. So this is an indication, a practical indication, that now the geometry can show anybody who examines heart how much of the point the top has become. This is called the base. This is called the apex. So if the base is starting to get smaller, then the heart specialist can know at what stage the person is in in congestive heart failure. Because once this point disappears, it becomes a cube. What does that indicate? The cube is earth. That means that congestive heart failure indicates that the person is becoming too materialistic. It's becoming too earthbound. There's not enough life force and the artistic side. Okay, so what we've got to do is to work with a person artistically to get them to have this to stop from happening and turning into a cube. That affects everyone on the planet. That is what's so important about this form and where it's headed. It becomes congested. So the inside of the heart and the healthy state looks like this. And here it is inside. I've made it inside. Of course, I've, I've made this so it can move. The heart doesn't do that on the out inside. It moves like that on the outside, but the inside twists. So here's why it twists. This is, this is a healthy heart, and this is how it moves. That's inside down, not on the outside, but the inside. Congestive heart failure looks like this. There's not enough movement. And that's why it gets congested. So here's the difference between the healthy heart and the congested heart. Here it is. This is becoming acute. In that process, um, when I discovered geometry was in the uh, ninth grade. In the ninth grade, I only failed once, one class in my prior year. I, I failed one class. I failed geometry. Because I was more interested in drawing cartoons. And 
And I could draw a straight line while the ruler used to really make it bad. They have it. Now, when you got a cube, you go into the three, it's vesicopisis. About what? It's a vesicopisis. So that means that there's two spheres that are interpenetrating that. So that means that there's four diagonals. So you have to have eight sets of spheres, right? Right? Because I mean, each one of those. I'd, so I'd like to see that. You know what I mean? Four diagonals. Each diagonal has got a bit of vesicopisis. So, like, so I'd like to see this cube oh, just with an overlapping vesicopisis on top of it. Every way. All the way around. The cube. The three dimensional. Uh, okay. The four diagonals. Yes. I'd like to see that. Yeah. Yeah. See? That. yeah. That's a great. Yeah. That's great. So I brought in Russell for you guys. Yeah. yeah. That was awesome. awesome. And you brought in Russell. I, I wanted to do that. I didn't know how yeah. to do that, but I wanted to do Perfect. it. Perfect. Because, uh, you know, slid it right in there. You have a lot of people who are into Russell, and that's yeah. very important. Yeah. These Is things aren't separate. You know, I'm not separate from these things. They're, You're these tapping into some, the same separate. divine illumination that he tapped into. Well, it's all right. cosmic knowledge.